get on this evening. It might take it a minute. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to this week's Matrix discussion group call, as in exiting the Matrix for tactical sovereignty. And this week, uh, we've got a uh, gentleman with us, uh, Chance. Chance is with us. He has the YouTube channel Interverse. And, you know, the way I came across Chance was kind of interesting because I had been listening to another YouTube channel. And, you know, it's one of the things I find fascinating. In my mind, I think there's like these thousands and thousands of active channels out there. And I run into people who will mention three or four channels and they're listening to the same ones I'm listening to. I don't know if it's just because we have the same interest, but it's like I very rarely hear like brand new channels mentioned. But anyway, I was listening to an interview and I got a little disheartened because I heard more from the host than I heard from the guest. And so I just went to their YouTube page and went to where they advertised it at and said, yeah, just wondering, is there another place where I can hear another interview by this gentleman? You know, I, was, I didn't really hear a whole lot from him. I was trying to say it nicely. <laughs> you know, I wasn't trying to say, you know, I hear you moderators all the time. I know all the stuff you guys know and all the things you think, you know, I wanted to hear the guest and you guys freaking did all the talking. So hopefully I don't do that this evening. But anyway, Chance piped in and I, I was really shocked. He's like, yeah, I've got an interview with him here on Interverse. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Cool. So I went and listened to that and then started listening to more videos on Chance's channel. And I think we are in a spot right now. We are very fortunate to have the Internet as open as it is. Uh, Sundar Pichai here a month or two ago made a statement. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, um, the web isn't going to be the wild, wild west forever. Uh, kind of hinting that they're going to tighten things down or his ultimate goal or plan that was, you know, they're going to rein things in. And we've seen that happening in the past couple of years. But anyway, my, my goal right now, I think, is for as many of us to get to know each other, get to know different platforms where there's information and things like that right now while we can. But this is a time to be doing our networking because in another six months or a year, who knows? This time may be gone, but I'm going to turn off my video and I'm going to mute myself and turn things over to Chance. Welcome, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm coming in all right. You can hear me. Sound beautiful. Awesome. And yeah, um, I'm trying to rack my brain about who that interview was with that you were wanting to hear more of, but... Uh, thanks for letting people know about my channel. You can just go to interversepodcast.com to subscribe to it on whatever platform you like. And I do my best not to do all the talking. Some episodes I do better than others. <laughs> I know how it is as a host. If uh, I give you a, if I give you a hint, will you pick up on it? A hint like that you have something to say. A, a hint as to oh, on the uh, guest um, that I asked about what yeah, channel what channel that was. Um. There was a book written by Edgar Allan Poe. That might give you a hint as to the name of the YouTube channel. I try to blank. I, 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 just, to I, just, I, I, I just didn't really want to come out and say who it is, but I, it, it was Code Triple Seven. You know? oh, and I love their yeah. stuff, but I love their stuff. <laughs> they don't need any more advertising. More information from that guest. I'm like, <laughs> anyway, go yeah. ahead, bro. Yeah, that guy actually was on their show because I connected them. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, Dylan Sococcio. I recommend his books, Spirit World. It ties into a lot of the law stuff that I'm sure you guys talk about, but then he goes through and, and explains the symbolism of the various world religions and how they all connect to the sky clock, that Crow would call it, and the deep phonetic Kabbalah that is exactly the same way that the law black magic works sounds like it's like and all that but applied to spiritual things and in context of where we even got the law system that we've got today and what i wanted to i kind of prepped some stuff for this i i figured <laughs> figured that we could have some fun with maybe looking at uh history and a possible future of this concept called the straw man or the you know, fictional identity. And so I'll screen share a little bit here. The first, if you're ready, I'll just kind of jump in because I have many slides. We don't have to get through all of them, but 
there's a lot of fun stuff that I'd like to bounce around with uh, you here and see what you think about it. It might be a little more on the esoteric, less than practical side, but it is kind of interesting to pay attention to what really popular things in mass media, especially like if your audience isn't super hip to what goes on in video games these days, I think this will be quite interesting because it's bigger than Hollywood at this point. And that's where, I mean, Hollywood is a sinking ship. It's a dying giant, if you will. And a lot of the resources of Hollywood have just shifted over to the game industry. And a lot of the game industry's resources are now employed for Hollywood in terms of like everything being CGI. So um, I'll switch to this slide, my screen share button. Made a little PowerPoint here. Uh, the first slide is just a title, A Brief History of Cyber Psychosis. And the game I'm going to be using as a bit of an example, it won't be like a big plot analysis or anything. We're just going to be looking at major themes as a type of, I don't know if I would even call this game predictive programming. I would say that you might even have a lot of artists involved with the making of this game that we're trying to warn us about what transhumanism really is. And then layered on top with all the agenda that the larger producer and publisher wanted to make sure got inserted. I think some renegade artists made their point pretty well with this particular game. Uh, it's called Cyberpunk 2077. I'll explain more about what it is, but the concept of cyberpsychosis in that game is when somebody has replaced so much of their body with artificial pieces and implants and all that, that something just breaks and they go crazy. They become violent. They become psychopaths and they're extra dangerous psychopaths because they have like robot arms and stuff. <laughs> Uh, and I think this applies to man as a metaphor and uh, hopefully will remain only a metaphor. And then we don't go further into this like merger of man with machine, Darth Vader future. But as a metaphor for the straw man, it makes perfect sense that whenever you acquire this demonic possession as an instrument to use in commerce, you are now giving yourself a method to go to war with your fellow man and uh, act in a psychotic way, but in a way that's socially acceptable, which is like, how can I make as much of a profit off of the widgets I've got to sell as I possibly can, you know? Not everybody engaged in commerce has this bad attitude, but like the, we're still playing Monopoly here and Monopoly's Monopoly. <laughs> you can't get away from that. So anyway, I think this idea of cyberpsychosis applies to whenever we are possessed of the straw man to the point where we, you know, everything's about climbing the corporate ladder and you don't care who you step on. And obviously that's where we got the world that we're in right now. So I'm going to pop over to the next slide. <laughs> I thought this was funny. It's uh, so how we see our digital identity. I'm showing Neo from the matrix. We think we're this godlike, super badass. Uh, woke. No, nah, I don't know. Woke's not the right word. Although a lot of Keyboard warriors these days claim to be woke uh, on both sides of the false political divide. But the reality of our digital identity is this cartoon straw man. It's pretty weak. <laughs> uh, and I think this image, it, it speaks for itself. But I wanted to know, you know, Brian, before I go forward, if you had any thoughts about the things I just brought up, the, the metaphor of cyberpsychosis or this, uh, the way people see themselves online versus the reality of what they are in their digital identity because you know these keyboard warriors really do think they're like superheroes uh saving the world whether it's q people waking supposedly red pilling everybody or it's the leftists being woke because they know that all we should talk about is racism <laughs> anyway what do you think man no I, you know I, I would agree with you i i think um yeah you're depicting it there in a physical way uh as to you know, making man stronger or, you know, gosh, there's been all these superhero movies out the past few years. And so I find the that superhero really these days is like back in the day, the superhero was the guy that was going to do the right thing. No matter what the Spider-Man cartoon I watched in the nineties, I kid you not. He never even throws a punch or tries to harm anyone. He just subdues the bad guys and, you know, brings them to justice. But now the superhero that is the best is the one that can defeat brutally defeat or even kill the most bad guys the fastest you know and the most flashy way and that's the superhero archetypes corruption actually this is a great point to make um 
right now because a, a larger theme of this conversation is going to be the concept of the corruption of archetypes over time. How the archetypes not only speak to us, but that as we change our vision of the archetypes and then the, our collective unconscious in the Jungian sense, that then the, we're changing nature itself. And we see this in the, uh, the corruption of nature by our corruption in the fact that, you know, the biosphere is not as diverse as it once was. When I drive home on a three hour trip across Missouri, I don't have bugs on my windshield like I used to, things like that. I mean, we notice it more and more every year, like the bees. And anyway, I think this is an important point to realize that if we corrupt our, our, our vision of the archetypes, then that also, it leads to a corruption of our nature because archetypes are nature, but we'll get more into that. I'm leaving you some space if you've got anything, or I can move on to uh, slide three. Um, well, yeah, you brought up archetypes, and you know, when I hear archetypes, I can't help but hear also uh, archons, you know. And when I think archons, and you start researching that, I mean, it kind of led me into the direction of parasites, you know. And uh, but yeah, that can go into a whole freaking exoteric direction itself. So go ahead. <laughs> it's actually brilliant because uh, another component. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of parts of this meal tonight. But another part of it that is going to be involved is like Gnosticism and uh, explaining the way Gnosticism has evolved and updated itself for a modern palate. But first, you can't really talk about these things without. <laughs> John Baudrillard, I think I said his name right, French, author of Simul Simulacra and Simulation, frequently quoted, Hyperreality. I'm just going to read this out loud. The media represents a world that is more real than reality that we can experience. People lose the ability to distinguish between reality and fantasy. They also begin to engage with the fantasy without realizing what it really is. They seek happiness and fulfillment through the simulacra of reality that is media, and avoid the contact or interaction with the real world. And uh, if that's not what the straw man paradigm does to us, I don't know what else to say. I mean, <laughs> we turn nature, which is source, into a resource, and we simulate it in a, as a, our possession instead of us being all possessions of the creator, if that makes sense. And yeah. uh, so, hey, you know, to put... I was oh, saying, you know what? I put didn't straw pull man. up the quote on screen. Let me put it on screen while you talk. All right. To put the straw man in, in simplest of terms, uh, what I compare it to is a debit card. The debit card is what you use to interact through to take care of banking and purchases and things like that between a business and the bank. And I, I look at the straw man as kind of the same thing. It is something else that's an artificial entity that's being used to interact uh, whether it's a state or government or whatever and the reason the base reason behind that is because like things can only contract with like things and uh, I'll leave it there yeah that's a that's a really good quote right there hyper reality yeah it's explaining it, it's a uh... Really great explanation of all the different ways that this emergence of artificiality versus reality crops up in the fractal. So many ways. But to talk about this idea of the updated Gnosticism, I really think that that's what simulation theory is. And as we talk about different stuff, there, it's going to remind people of the Matrix. I already kind of referenced the Matrix. And... Uh, a lot of elements of that game cyberpunk that maybe I won't even get into plot wise because it would probably be beyond the scope of what we'd have time for. Also recall this idea of simulation theory in a sense, but in the transhuman sense, which is the idea that you could simulate your consciousness into a digital construct or an engram of some kind. But the reason why I call simulation theory the materialist version of Gnosticism isn't because I want to completely knock Gnosticism. I just want to show because I, I think that we can get something out of everything we look at, but the result of a lot of Gnostic thought is very much the same as 
what a materialist person would think of as simulation theory. You have a fallen creator god, a demiurge, that builds a an imperfect world as a soul cage or soul prison and then takes fragments of the divine unity of the one light of source and chains them up into these meat sack bodies and then controls them tyrannically. I mean, that's like my take on it. I'm sure that that's not a very nice way of describing Gnostic thought and it leaves out a lot. But in general, that's the story that a lot of people get whenever they just take a cursory glance at Gnosticism. And it's really no different than the idea that you are somehow trapped in a digital artificial reality that you know some external god has built for you and even the you know judeo-christian dogma of god or jehovah being somehow outside of and separate from the creation i think that since you know we both are pretty familiar with clint's work and probably know that that's like that's a bad way of considering <laughs> the creator to try to like put it outside of the all it makes no sense if the all is the all then that's the all but that's what you get with uh, both both of these philosophies in their most corrupted sense. I mean, maybe a more pure version of simulation theory that's not as corrupted, similar to a more pure conceptualization of Gnosis would be not that this isn't real, but that if it is a simulation, it is one that we are spiritually simulating and it's, a, and it's not necessarily a prison, it's our own decision. And that's more empowering, but uh, I'm going to move on to this next slide and just show well, before how... you do that. Yeah. Before yeah, you do yeah. that, I was just going to say, uh, we've mentioned Clint, Rich Clint Richardson a couple times and, uh, Clint's been here with us a couple times as well. And, uh, love my the guy. Show as well. really love the guy. Really helped me and, out uh, here, learning wise. Yep. So I'm sure people are going to wonder who is this guy? Who is this guy? Uh, people could just, you can go to YouTube and just look up red pill Sunday school. And he's got two seasons of it now, and uh, that will give you a good idea. Um, I've got I've got him on my YouTube channel on my uh, creative playlist, and I've got Abjure the Realm on my YouTube playlist. I really recommend people get that, and they can also find his stuff on WordPress. I just under... went through Abjure the Realm last week, and it's a uh, it's more digestible in a lot of ways than some of his other lengthy work not that i don't think his all his work is worth checking out but that's a really good place to go for chance you want to hear here. something funny yeah <laughs> um here about two years ago a year and a half ago or two somebody sent me uh this video playlist They're like check this out and i was like okay <clears throat> i saw it was about an hour long something like that so i'm like okay i'll listen to it on the way to work and I turn it on on the way to work, and I'm listening to it for about two minutes, and I'm like, this is Clint Richardson. Because what it was was a computer audio voice reading something, and it was reading his writing of Abjure the Realm. And after like in two minutes into it, I'm like, I know who the author is. This is this has got to be Clint Richardson. So I went and did some style. research later on, and I'm like, boom, yep, that's him. <laughs> yeah, his writing style is... Uh very recognizable it's thorough and i think i might have been able to pick up on that too honestly after spending so much time reading straw man that book is like the definitive i mean i've only read half of the 1400 pages and i misplaced my book i need to find it find it again but <laughs> it's just jam-packed with all the, the legal definitions showing you how the the bible is actually the foundation of the legal system and why that matters and what you can learn from that. And it's great stuff. But uh, chance, chance, I might take you down another rabbit hole. <clears throat> yeah, let's go. Uh, when you're bringing up, you know, the, the Bible is the basis for the legal system. Um, one of the things I've always told people is that whenever you're trying to figure out a problem or a situation, go to the beginning. I mean, what, what did Bible start with? It started with in the beginning, right? So I have always been under the philosophy that you need to go to the beginning of any situation to really figure out where the problem might be. And uh, so what is the beginning of, say, for instance, uh, the current company in the United States? It is Title One. That's the beginning. Oh, 
I've lost your audio. You kind of dropped out audio wise. I'm still seeing you. You did warn me that you might drop out once in here. Still not hearing you, but I'm seeing you. There you are. All right. All right. You're at you're at title so, one right then. Yep. Yeah. So I, I went to title one and read that. And I'm like, gosh, this sounds kind of familiar. So I went and read it a second time. I'm like, gosh, I know this. How do I, what do I know this from? So I went back and I was reading it a third time and I was not even halfway through and I'm like, oh my gosh, I know what this is. This is books one and two of Genesis. That's all they did. They mirrored Genesis when they wrote Title One and Two. When it talks about the creation, and Title One is all about setting up jurisdiction, jurisdiction over the land, jurisdiction over water. On and on. It's like it's the same principles. They followed the same exact principles. But anyway, so I'll let you move on with your uh, next. No, that's interesting too because. Uh... One of the things I never picked up on in Genesis, to continue on this rabbit hole, is that there's two times that man is created. Man is created by Jehovah, and then Adam is created by the Elohim. And if that doesn't explain everything right there, I don't know what does. The Jehovah, which is a verb, the creative force of existence itself, brings forth man, which is all mankind, the uh, archetypal man. And then the Elohim, which is meaning lowercase g gods, in my opinion, that would be the magistrates who legally create the fiction of Adam, the name, give it a name. And so, of course, if you're going to be building, you know, <laughs> Satan's jurisdiction, you're going to want to do it the way that is, expl is explained by the very book that's warning you about how this happens and what it is. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Yep, absolutely. Then Namdagur is established, and we know there's power in the name, but there's a whole lot more to that. So, anyway. Yeah. You know, there's so much to it. Um, the game that I'm bringing up, Cyberpunk, the main character of this game, this game came out in 2020, by the way. It's based on an old tabletop role-playing game that was called Cyberpunk 2020 at one point, and then it was taken by this game developer and they made a they rebooted it as a video game and they put it in 2077. I think maybe people are familiar with 77 in the terms of like a black magic number. It uh references sorcery a lot of times. So I think it's very interesting that they would pick 2077 uh to update a game that was originally Cyberpunk 2020. A game that they actually were so desperate to get out in 2020 despite it being unfinished that they released a game that was not complete, like buggy, and it cost them to have to refund it to a lot of people and made a lot of people really mad. But I think it was important to them to put the game out in 2020. And here's another reason why. First of all, the main character is named V. V, just V, the 22nd letter of the alphabet. Also, the phrase transhuman future in Gematria full numerological reduction, it equals 22. A lot of the main characters in the game, I won't bother going through their names, but their names also break down to 22 or 220, things like that, in Gematria. And why this is interesting to me is because another character named V is from the movie V for Vendetta, which it went around the internet this year where people were saying, oh my God, this movie V for Vendetta was set in 2020. It's not entirely true. It was set in 2027. I looked it up tonight, like uh, the actual movie itself. But to just read off of the Wikipedia page for V for Vendetta, which is a movie that a lot of people probably heard of because it's from like 2005. <laughs> the plot of this movie is about a world in turmoil with the United States fractured as a result of a second civil war and a pandemic of a virus ravaging Europe and has caused uh, the United States to fall basically. So the United States is fractured into multiple st multiple countries now instead of one country. There's more to it than that, of course. V for Vendetta is a crazy movie, has a lot to do with bioweapons and things like that as well, and trauma based mind control. But interestingly enough, there's well, so many. Maybe, so many maybe this will help people remember. 
I mean, this will help people remember. Yeah, the guy Fox mask. Yeah. 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 By the way, who was the? Wasn't that guy a Jesuit? Oh yeah. Don't don't think too much about that. Guy Fox, the gunpowder pl plot that that's based on, was a uh, supposedly a Jesuit plot against the crown of England, something along those lines. But you know, well, the chance. Guy, you know what? That's what I, I I've harped on for a long time now, is that I think everybody talks about the wrong J word. <laughs> I totally believe they totally talk about the wrong J word. It's Jesuit. That's who you need to be looking at. Look at the Ivy League colleges. They're the ones that educate the world leaders. Look at all the different world. I don't care if it's Iran. I don't care if it's China. Look and see where they went to college at. They went to school at an Ivy League college in the U.S. Uh, you know, and the Jesuits reveal themselves all the time. If you do look into Gematria, they love that stuff. It's based on the concept that God speaks in letters and numbers. And so, and in words, more than words. And so they want to imitate the natural synchronicity of things because like, if you study Gematria, this is a side tangent, but there's a ton of synchronicity in the letters and numbers of your life and the important dates to you crazy amount it's all organic it's a maybe some people might even want to call that evidence for simulation theory or something i wouldn't i would call it evidence for that all is mind concept and then everything starts there but i think that 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 level of organic synchronicity between our language and numbers and how things line up in ways that are beyond coincidence if you start looking into and decoding phrases and, and words uh i think that's imitated as like that's what black magic tries to do an attempt to subvert the will of creation or impose their will on creation by imitating the mechanics of creation as closely as possible uh if that that's kind of how i see it i think like people that aren't too worried about trying to control everything in life don't spend a lot of time in ceremonial magic or ritual i'm not saying nobody is a good person that does that stuff that's not what i mean but I think a lot of the people that aren't interested in that, but are like on the right hand path, if you will, it's for them, it's more about just like trusting that if they're doing the right thing when it needs to be done, then all the stars will align for that automatically. And you don't need to like get the right type of wood and face the right direction and do it on a Wednesday and all this shit. <laughs> I mean, that's not my thing. I, I'm fascinated by that, but it's, it's not my thing. I'm not saying that there's no value in it. Like, um, my friend Dylan, he just put out his audiobook of Spirit World, the uh, author we talked about earlier, Dylan Sococcio. And he released it on a day that had favorable astrology alignments for such a, an endeavor. I don't think that he's wrong to do that. I think that's a good idea, actually. If there's anything to try to match up with, maybe just the sky clock itself is a good one. But don't, I don't know. I just don't think we need to get too crazy about that. And I think that the uh, <laughs> the controllers of the world do get really crazy about that. Especially, especially those J words. But I want to link. <clears throat> I want to link this game and V for Vendetta a little bit more closely. Uh, Cyberpunk and V for Vendetta. I'm going back to the screen share real quick. So, oddly enough, in this game, one of the main characters is played by Keanu Reeves, and it's the only Hollywood actor that. It, is digitally represented in this game and gives voice acting for it. And odd, more interesting is that he's a construct of someone's consciousness that was written into a computer to preserve them after their body was killed. So we have like sort of a reverse matrix instead of a his instead of a human consciousness in the machine world. It's a um, it's kind of different. It's a, a machine simulation of human consciousness projecting into the real world. <laughs> <laughs> but well, another way this links us back to the matrix is V for Vendetta. The main character of that movie V is uh, played by the guy who plays agent Smith in the matrix. So there's all this like interesting linking between cyberpunk and V for Vendetta and the matrix. And also an old movie called Johnny mnemonic that Keanu was in before he was even a big star. That was also from like the eighties or early nineties, I believe, and set in around this time of the future when the world is going into a deeper level of tyranny and control because of, yep, a virus from China 
So they don't mess around. They put that in multiple places. In the cyberpunk game story world, if you will, viruses are such a bad deal that the that they've exterminated all cats, dogs, birds, rats, every type of animal in a um, several mile radius of the big city that the game takes place in. So <laughs> there's a lot of hints at, at, there's a lot of like subtle clues about viruses and being a deal, big deal and like vaccinations just in the background of cyberpunk, but it's not a major theme. I just think it's interesting that these things all connect together. And this slide, it says from distraction to simula simulacra. I'm just showing how We've gone from at 1990, Super Mario World, this cartoon world, to Cyberpunk 2077, which is a highly realistic type of simulacra, and even starring the main character from a movie that was all about simulacra, The Matrix. And I'm just very fascinated by this. Um, <laughs> I wanted to throw this slide in here, too, real quick because it just shows how kind of crazy these people are that believe in this transhuman direction for humanity. Elon Musk saying, either going to create simulations that are indistinguishable from reality or civilization will cease to exist. Those are the two options. It sounds like a threat there, Elon Musk. <laughs> but, you know, what's interesting about this background picture is you might recognize these screenshots as being from the movie The Matrix, but that's not Keanu Reeves, that's Will Smith. You can look this up on YouTube, but there's a lot of videos where people have done this with their own at home, deep learning AI programs on their home computer, where you can actually take a different celebrity or different actor and have the AI replace the original person in the movie that they're in with that actor and make it look like almost indistinguishable from reality. If you look up Will Smith as Neo in the Matrix, deep fake, look that up. You'll see what I'm talking about. And that's from years ago. And that's that's like a the technology that's available to, you know, some random guy with a YouTube channel. So you tell me, you really think that what you see on the news and on the TV, is that even real in any sense? I mean, some of it might be a live feed of an actual camera, sure. But like, what? Their ability to fake stuff is so far beyond that to me, it's almost like the reason that they make the fakes that they do, like fake shootings and stuff so obvious is because uh, maybe they're faking it so that they A, don't actually have to kill anyone and B, people that have two brain cells left to rub together might start to realize what's going on here and start to question reality. I really think that there's a component of why the lie exists in reality as being literally as our guide to truth. Like, you got to start in the lie to even find truth. I really think that is the way things work. That's why we have the lesson of, of Satan or artificial intelligence, artificial consciousness, demonic entities, whatever you want to call it. This, this perpetual spiritual warfare that humanity fights within itself. I think it's so that we can find truth within ourselves. I think if truth was the only option, uh, it would be hard to understand what we are. Because the truth is the total of all that's real. And the only way that you can, it's like, think about it in context of rights, right? But negative rights are things that are your right, uh, that you don't have the right to do are the only things you can't do. So if you're talking about your rights in a negative sense, then you're saying that you have every right to take any action except those which are specifically listed that you can't take. Like do no harm. You basically, that's your rights is uh, you have the right to do no harm and anything else is also your right in a sense. And then the positive rights are applied after the fact and you only have the rights that are applied through positive law, like bill of rights, like you have these specific rights and privileges and that's what you have. And I think that f coming to truth is similar. Uh, the truth about truth is it's everything except for the couple of things that it's not, couple of things relative to infinity, I should say. From our perspective, it's a lot of things, a lot of lies, a lot of untruth, a lot of simulation and artificiality. But I do think that there's a reason we have this process running in humanity. Uh, here's another slide that just kind of shows some people that are half machine, uh, gives you the vibe of this game a little bit. I'll skip forward. Um, let's stop here and see what you might have. And then we're going to talk a little bit about... <laughs> 
identity politics and go further into this because identity politics is the next mask up from the uh, the basic straw man, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, I've had these discussions with a lot of people that uh, maybe not necessarily a part of the woke community or truth community or whatever. And uh, I'll say, um, for instance, talking about geoengineering and talking about, um, you know, seeds and manipulations of, you know, plant life and things like that. And they're like, you know, it's, some of their attitudes are like, well, that's normal. I mean, that's why we have better stuff now than we did years ago. But it's like, they don't understand the flip side of, you know, like, yeah, but some of the things that are being used now can also cause harm. It's like myself, for instance, um, I, I killed myself in a car accident a number of years ago and air flighted to the hospital. And fortunately, the doctor that was there to work on me that night, he had just gone to a seminar. And he was one of the number one doctors when it came to doing, sit, working on bones and uh, prosthetics and things like that. <clears throat> and he said, you know, if it had been six months ago, I would have amputated your leg. But instead, he said, I'm going to try out some of the stuff I learned, you know, and today I'm okay. And, uh, you know, no fake leg or anything like that. Everything's, it appears normal even though there's a lot of metal inside me, okay? So, yeah, things can be done to enhance, but there becomes a tipping point where the enhancement takes over. I'm and I glad think that's what we are ordering on today. Because I don't want anyone to think that, like, I'm telling you you're somehow anti-nature if you get a prosthetic arm and you had an accident, you know? That's, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because obviously, yeah, there's a, there's a difference there. It's about like, it's, it has to do a lot with the motivation of why you want the implant or the prosthetic or whatever it is. That has a lot to do with it, I think. Right. But, you know, I, I really think we're nearing a point where we're coming to see an evolution to this, to where now that prosthetic actually takes over the body. And so the body being in control of the prosthetic. I think that's kind of a good uh, way of picturing it. You mean like iPhones? <laughs> it's a prosthetic <laughs> brain. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, seriously, exactly. Though. Yeah, that, it's a pro yeah, you know what it Android. is? It's a prosthetic pineal gland. It's not a prosthetic brain. It's a it's a prosthetic fucking pineal gland. I have never thought about this before, but like this is key. I really think that that's like what this smartphone technology represents i mean even the computer to a degree but the way that the computer works versus the phone you still have some more freedom on the phone on the computer that you don't have on the phone and you know what you were talking about the free and open internet and how we might not have it for longer than we much longer or we might not have it as long as we'd hoped we would in the cyberpunk world there is no more free and open internet, of course, because of cyber terrorism. And what you get if you want to connect to the net is you have a terminal that they come and install in your house that the net company NetWatch owns, and they install that terminal. Or you can use public data, data terminals from around the city that you can just walk up to like a phone booth. But that's it, that's it, and there's only the websites that are permitted and allowed and licensed. And it's kind of like the idea of needing a driver's license to get on the internet because you do have to have that level of like ID to access the public data terminals. And also in this world, you only can go to the corporately allowed sites. So I think that that is one of the things where I'm just like, I think they're warning some of the artists that made this game were trying to warn people about what could happen. Not, I don't think it's like predictive programming when people say stuff like that. I think these projects, especially when it comes to a game that took hundreds of people to make, you're going to get people of all different in intentions putting something into it. And usually the ones that are the creative ones, the writers and and uh, the art, like the graphic artists and stuff. It's I have a personal theory that those people 
are better than we give them credit for because they spend so much time with that pineal gland working with the imagination uh, some things come through that they didn't even know were going to drop into their lap things that we can interpret from our side of observing what they made that they might have even not even known were put in there synchronistic archetypal information and so it's in my opinion we can't just like throw the baby out with the bath water with everything from the mass media but we should practice discernment because there's some things that there's nothing you're not getting an, an ounce of good out of some of this stuff but you know sitcoms like where's the creativity there it's pretty much dead but something like this game that i'm talking about there is a lot of creativity involved but then it's a mixed bag in terms of the symbolism that it uh has got going on for it let's like talk about that reminds me of something that reminds me of something i wanted to ask you about and, and, and so this is probably going to add another five minutes or so anyway, but no worries. I mean, and, and you're totally correct. You're totally correct. Well, and I don't know what your time is like, but I, I schedule these for three hours for a three hour block. That way I've got plenty of time. You know what I mean? And most of the time it only lasts like an hour, but you know, if more information comes through then, and you need the time, then it's there, but either way, uh, but no, you, you're totally correct. And, and that is that, you know, uh, people that don't know the truth are at the mercy of liars. And that's what it comes down to. You've got to be able to discern things. And I, I want to ask you, because um, I know you, you meditate, correct? Yeah, I do. I do meditate. I mean, I won't claim to be the most consistent, best meditator. But, you know, there's times in my life where I've had a good, such a good practice that in the times of my life where my practice isn't that good, I can still drop into it in a less complete way. I don't know. I definitely do it. It's It was life-changing to pick up that practice for sure. I, I don't know if I do it the same way as everybody else. <laughs> Who knows? Right. I think we all probably have our own way of doing it. I mean, I know when I first learned about it uh, was like in the 80s, and I was studying like the Beatles and things they had done and stuff like that. And so I, I went down the trail of um, transcendental meditation and checking that out and then started practicing it myself and have continuously used it you know ever since i was a kid but i've found the past few years that it's opened into another realm of i don't know whether it's pineal gland or whatever but it's it's like where um i don't want to call it time travel but where you can actually visually even see the room you're in even though your eyes are closed or you see other places um I, I guess that would maybe even border on remote viewing a little bit i just was wondering if you'd had any of those experiences also i have uh they don't they seem to coincide with different times of my life more than being anything i can predictably expect interestingly enough but yeah i've had some really weird ones like um my experience with other pineal activating practices lets me know that at some points in deep meditation, I've had what you would call like a pineal aperture opening, seeing other places. And then also what I have a lot with meditation is and I'll practice this consciously occasionally, the ability to act, to see and sense the room around me that I'm physically in, that my body's in. That's kind of where, my meditation practice was pretty like in the clouds and I would go places and daydream and space out. But in the last few years, the way that meditation feels is just like, I'm very grounded in my body, present in the room I'm in, maybe even with my eyes closed, sensing or seeing in my mind's eye, the room around me and just super in the breath, focused on the breathing patterns itself and not really going places too much or thinking too much. So. I think these practices evolve with all of us over time. Uh, sometimes I miss going to other dimensions accidentally. <laughs> and I don't know what it means to have one thing happening or an over another. I don't want to like qualitatively say one experience is better than the other. I think it's just that it's good to just still yourself. And even if you're not doing it for the transcendental aspect, the activating of the parasympathetic nervous system through calmness and rest is invaluable. And 
that's kind of what I'm intending for with the practice in the first place is get some more oxygen than I would have had if I didn't do it and calm myself down, bring myself to stillness. And, you know, speaking of time, tra time travel, I really think that whenever you spend time in spill stillness, that you create more space in your life and time is less compressed in your life. I think we're all wrong about time. I mean, if you really want to get to the root of the straw man, it is definitely Kronos. Kronos is in there. <laughs> the concept of time and the timestamp. Uh, that's really the ultimate mark, I think, in a weird way, which also has to do with why it matters the what kind of a realm we're in. If we're in a snow globe or a spinning ball or any of the or maybe some other option. I think the way time works it is important how we decide to count it and why we count it the way we count it. There's a lot to that, but um, let, uh, I'm just going to think about what I want to go into next. Uh, we could talk a little bit about the identity politics. We could kind of skip through that a little bit and look at, um, get into more of the esoteric side of the, this conversation. Um, you know, what I'll just say about the identity politics thing, I'll hold off on this for this interview. I don't think it's super important. Uh, it's just that <laughs> they made a huge effort in this game to, I will go ahead and sc screen share this. They made a huge effort in this game to try to pander to the transgender idea movement, those type of people. I don't say, I'm careful about how I say this because like I have friends that are of all types. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with any one of these people. What I'm seeking to bring out with this conversation is the qu question of why is this phenomenon ramping up and why is it promoted by so much media? Like that it's almost a, to a badge of honor or a token that you need to present to even be considered acceptable in the, in the mainstream at this point. So why is that happening? Uh, what I have written on this slide is the answer to that question is body dysphoria. And that's a bigger conversation. But I'm going <laughs> to read just from the bottom of this article. This is an article about somebody complaining before the game came out that it wasn't transgender enough. And I'll explain how they decided to answer that, those uh, accusations that were coming at them from the dark recesses of the internet in a second. But the guy who's being quoted in this article says, I experienced dysphoria without a word for it, just a deep discomfort with many aspects of my body. It was easier to imagine myself as a cyborg than my birth sex because it was the closest thing to not male or female I had as a concept. And this goes back to the Gnostic idea. Even though it might not seem connected, the, it's both, both things are an expression of n not feeling at home in your body, not feeling like your body is you. And, you know, th this dualis dualism paradigm that's been presented by most schools of thought in the West forever, that there's a separation between soul and body or spirit and body. And I really think that that's part of what's damaging us is that belief in there being a hard separation. I kind of look at it like spirit is the, a seed and then the body is a tree. But once the tree is grown, where's the seed at? You know, you couldn't go open up the tree and find the original seed, that, but it's still there. It's the whole thing now. And then it's just going to, we're going to migrate into a different form at some point too, maybe like a sine wave oscillating. But I think it's harmful to look at our self, our capital S self, as separate from our body while we're inhabiting it. Because, I mean, it's the temple that we were gifted uh, in, in terms of anything that distinguishes us from the pure ambiguity of nature, that body is highly connected to it. What are its aptitudes, the things it enjoys and doesn't enjoy? It's connected to this personality ego that is always under attack from old religions and the modern new age movement. It's all about kill your ego, kill your ego, become soulless, more like become programmable. If you ask me, but let's skip to this next one here. Um, they say they're saying 
about the game, the developers were saying, you don't choose, I want to be a male or a female character. You now choose a body type. And so that's the way they decided to give the people that were demanding more trans inclusivity what they wanted in the cyberpunk game. So I've never before played a video game where you could actually customize your junk. I'm not even kidding, Brian. It shows you full frontal nudity of your character if you want to see it. You can be, you know, maimed with circumcision or a, a regular pure penis. You can have like an artificial robotic like uh, penis, mechanical penis. You can be smooth like a Ken doll. <laughs> you can be a man's body with uh, no genitals and a female voice, or you can you can have no nipples. You can. I'm trying to think of all the things you can do. You can obviously can be trans. You can have a penis and you can have breasts and then whatever voice type you want with that. Anyway, to them that was their answer to making the game more inclusive to trans people. And they inserted a lot of characters that were either homosexual or transsexual in the game as well. A lot of it felt like natural storytelling for a game set in 2077, but some of it was like obviously weird and forced, at least on the trans side. And surprise, surprise, this community, I don't have a slide for it, but they weren't happy with the way trans people were represented. They believe that it was like uh, their identities were being exploited by a corporation for uh, to get people to support it, if that makes sense. And I was like, well, that's the perfect metaphor for the direction the world's going in. That's very 2077, in my opinion. They're just being accurate. <laughs> And how, in terms of how gender identity and, and identity in general would continue to be exploited as a political weapon, a divide and conquer weapon in 2077. I mean, I think they are making a good statement there. Not to, I mean, how could you even, I don't even know how they could have portrayed trans people in a way that would have made those who want to be outraged and victimized, outraged and victimized. And I'm sure there's lots of people out there that are transgender that played it and were fine and they didn't go out and have outrage and victimization. So that's the thing that I'm really pointing out is how this the identity politics in general is just about creating division. So what's really fascinating too about this <clears throat> original cyberpunk tabletop RPG was that in 1994, a guy who was writing for this game that was uh, just like a Dungeons & Dragons style game back then, pen and paper, there's a description of 2020 from the supplemental text that goes with this game. I'm just going to read it from this 1994 game set in 2020. It is now accepted among historical scholars that in the decades before the collapse, America suffered from the sickness of racism and cultural identity. Everyone wanted to be seen as special. Every group had to be equal or preferably better than its neighbors and fought to protect its special rights. If anyone had something that someone else wanted, they were painted as racist, sexist, elitist, or worse. This divisive me first attitude eventually tore the fabric of America apart and caused it to self-destruct in a fireball of competing ideologies, none of which truly recognized each other's validity. Diversity led inexorably to anarchy. And so I have uh, some protesters from 2020 in this slide and then a picture of people protesting with their masks on in Cyberpunk 2077 in the future. thought that was interesting that they're even showing, you know, mask, masked protesters. That's fascinating to me. But let's talk about this identity politics thing, Brian. Um, what do you think about having your gender or your sexual preference become a legal status? You think that's good for you? <laughs> well, you know, this is something I looked at a number of years ago. I would, I want to say maybe 12 years ago or so, because one of the things that I noticed or was noticing on television was, for instance, they had, um, if you remember the show, Will and Grace. Um, Will and Grace was, it, it's like, two minutes or one minute didn't go by without a joke about sexuality. And the, after the show went off from being regularly aired on whatever night or whatever time, they were still showing it three, four, five times a day. 
on different channels. And it was like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, everywhere you look, this was back when I did watch TV. It's like everywhere I went, it was like that show was on. And when you look at the population, and well, and here's the thing. A lot of the speculation, a lot of things that people said was, well, they've got to pander to that audience. Oh, really? They have to pander to that audience. Let's take a look at that audience. That audience made up like a tenth of 1% of the population. That's not a big, huge chunk of the market share there, is it? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so now when I'm seeing these things happening, and you mentioned like the divide and conquer or whatever, it, to me it might even go deeper because this isn't a big enough part of the population to try to like absorb into the melting pot. You know what I mean? There, there's like something else going on here. And well, you know, you mentioned earlier, act, like transgenderism is a is a promise to never have children for the rest of your life. That's abs important. Absolutely. That's a big, big important part of it. I, I think with anything that happens, there's never one reason. There's always two, three, four, five reasons behind it. And <clears throat> a, a lot of what you were discussing also is it's a separation between the mind and the body. It's making them two totally separate things. And, you know, going back for centuries, one of the favorite ways of execution was the guillotine. Okay? Well, you look at spiritually what people thought over the years, and the idea behind using the guillotine was that if you separate the body from the head, then the spirit can't be rejoined in the afterlife. That was the reason for doing it. So it's like, is that kind of a physical way that they're they're doing it now today? They're trying to separate the body from the mind. And they're already controlling the spirit as it is. So mind, body, and spirit, yeah, they've got it all freaking figured out, don't they? <laughs> yeah, man. I really like what you, what you're saying. It made me think about it a lot. Uh. I do think that that is a very interesting symbolism of the decapitation uh, is symbolic of the way that spiritually man in mass has ejected from his cockpit. Like if you're just feeling like a floating head, so disconnected from your body that you don't even know how ill you are from the bad diet or the lack of exercise or whatever it is, you've become so used to these signals of constant discomfort from your body that's out of balance that you've had to shut off all those signals just to conserve electricity. Your body's so low on electricity that it can't even really send you the signals of how it feels about what you're doing to it anymore. That's how much people have beat down their body. And so that's what I mean by like they've ejected from their cockpit. They're no longer at their, they're no longer inside themselves feeling all the communications from all the, the systems of their body. It's like they're on just a few systems. They're, they're running on, you know, the backup generator. And all they have the juice for is like eyes and ears and, and mouth <laughs> and basic digestion. And anyway, uh, this is the body let, dysphoria let me, that I'm talking let me hit about. On. This is what leads people to all kinds of crazy philosophies of believing that the body's a prison and that they need to replace their meat or whatever but yeah go ahead yeah let me let me touch on being separated from the body uh, on a couple points here um <clears throat> the accident i was in of course there's major nerve damage okay I, i've got advanced neuropathy because of it which just means pain in the nerves it's getting worse and worse nothing you can do about it that's basically what it means anyway so it, the doctors were always like, oh, what about this drug? What about that drug? They even wanted to put me on oxys. And I was like, are you kidding me? And so that's like for stage four cancer. What would I want? I said, getting off those things is worse than the pain you start out with. You know what I mean? I just interviewed like, a guy well, we who wanted... had to tell his whole story about getting off oxys and how hellish it was. Oh, yeah, it's horrible. But I, I said, listen, I said, I don't care. I know I'll be in pain the rest of my life, but I don't care about a little bit of pain. Because the reason why that pain exists is 
a part of my body is telling me something. And what's happening is my left leg, my left part of the body is telling my brain, if you're going to jump off something, don't land on your left foot first. <laughs> or don't use your left foot to try and strain and push something or whatever. You know what I mean? It's telling me to protect that side. That's what your pain is doing. And it's just like if uh, I can briefly touch on the whole uh, boogeyman situation going on right now. When you get sick and say, for instance, one of the symptoms is you have no taste buds. You can't taste anything. That is your brain or your body, whatever, telling you, guess what? You need to go on a fast. You need to quit eating for a while. Because when you go on a fast, then all of your organs, your liver, your kidney, your pancreas, they all go into freaking hyperdrive and start really taking care of things inside the body. That's what a fast is for. That's what a fast does for you. And so I you never get thought about that symptom. Body. Being a, a signal for that. I'm going to tell people that because I think that you're on to something. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure I am. I, I think our body is telling us stuff all the time. And this goes back to just what you're talking about. If they can separate our mind from our body, to where we aren't paying attention to these things anymore, then guess what? Boy, that's a big hurdle they just conquered, isn't it? Yeah, what if your body is mostly copyrighted technology, technological replacements? <laughs> you know, you're under warranty. <laughs> That's uh, this next slide shows this. Like, there's a bunch of crazy advertisements you can find in the game world if you just look at billboards around the city. This one on the right just blows my mind. Do you hate your meat? Is what it says, and it's a guy ripping the skin off of his face. It's really graphic, but you know, they're depicting a future where the sexuality and the violence of media is like, you know, progressed from where we're at now, plus 55, 57 years. So worse. And so a lot of it's really shocking. I have a few slides with crazy uh, in-game ads, but which is also why I think these artists were like trying to warn us of transhuman hell, not uh, pre-program us, in my opinion. That's, there's one up here on the top left. Try our new meat paste. And then I have here just like a snip of in-game text you can read about how people eat basically mulched up crickets and worms. And at the bottom it says, while eating crickets has become acceptable, most consumers still bristle at being told to go eat worms. <laughs> but you know, in this game world, meat is like not an option. They've told the story of climate change, being worse and worse, which is now there's something that is uh, pre programming something that might not be as accurate as people uh, think in you know the mainstream schools of thought about climate change. But they've take like the the poor people have no access to meat at all. They eat single celled protein, synthetically grown and made into. Uh, mixed with other synthetic flavorings to make whatever they are eating. But like, literally there's a bunch, this is the perfect metaphor. There's a bunch of different food items in the game, in the game world, like synthetic tacos, synthetic milk, like you name it, but it's all made of the same thing. It's all made. You know, of what chance? You know I, I can see the billboard already. Soylent green. It does a body good. <laughs> you know there's a, a real life protein shake out there called soylent like they just went oh they just gosh. went for it they just went for it man it exists look that up <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> but you know why i think that there's some real deep esoteric thinkers involved with this game is because they put things in like on the right here is a, a snippet from a poem by william blake that they hid in the game for someone to find if they're looking for it. William Blake is one of the greatest mystic poets of all time. And he wrote a poem called America, a prophecy. It's a long epic poem. And I'm going to read this passage. This is the only passage they added to the game. And this is where we're going to put on our metaphor hats now, get poetic, because that's where all the deepest wisdom is. 
reality is a is a constant set of metaphors and things that symbolize one another as part of the fractality of it. So this snippet of America, a prophecy by William Blake. The terror answered, I am orc, wreathed round the accursed tree. The times are ended, shadows pass, the morning gins to break. The fiery joy that Urizen perverted to ten commands. Urizen is like the demiurge in Blake's cosmology. What night he led the starry host through the wild, wide wilderness? That stony law I stamp to dust and scatter religion abroad to the four winds as a torn book, and none shall gather the leaves. But they shall rot on, but they shall rot on desert sands and consume in bottomless deeps to make the deserts blossom and the deeps shrink to their fountains, and to renew the fiery joy and burst the stony roof that pale religious lechery seeking virginity may find it in a harlot and in coarse clad honesty that the undefiled though ravished in her cradle night and morn for everything that lives is holy life delights in life because the sweet because the soul of sweet delight can never be defiled fires enwrap the earthly globe yet man is not consumed Amidst the lustful fires he walks, his feet become like brass, his knees and thighs like silver, and his breast and head like gold. And what I think is fascinating is he's talking about how America is going to basically have to destroy the sort of demiurge version of law, the stony law, the Ten Commandments. Not the Ten Commandments on the stone, but like, I think he's talking about the bindings of religion and the the legal system as a religion, in a sense. And that scattering that book to the winds, if you will, metaphorically, is what's going to lead to the rebirth, rebirthing of nature. And that when he says that, that pale religious lechery seeking virginity, He's talking about the spirit of Urizen or the Demiurge or the artificer or, or Satan, this satanic concept, the art, the artificial that is evil. And I don't think all artificiality is evil. I think there's art that's good, but I think all evil is artificiality. <laughs> and, you know, he's predicting that these fires of the lustful fires that man walks amidst in the future of America. That would be the result of, you know, us looking for purity in corruption, because that's what people are doing. Seeking virgin, the pale religious, religious lechery seeking virginity may find it in a harlot, is I think referring to Babylon. That man has this illusion that this Babylon system could be perfected, could be made fair, pure beneficial for everybody in line with nature and that it, this concept that Blake is referring to of man, be, his feet becoming like brass, his knees and thighs, like silver, his breast and head, like gold. I'm sure that has a lot deeper meaning esoterically. And that's probably referring to the alchemical purification process. We're going through what I described earlier, how lies lead us to the truth. If we didn't see these outrageous lies on, 9-11 or all of 2020 or whatever, whatever ones that they we, that we witnessed that caused us to go like, wait, well, what's the actual truth? That's what the lies are for. But I thought it was just interesting that they grabbed a snippet of the poem because it parallels the story of the cyberpunk game. There's a screenshot to the left. There's a character here. She's completely replaced everything biological with metal. Like the question must be asked if you replaced every part of your body are you still you anymore and the answer to the question about that character on the left is they've got cyber psychosis and they like killed some people or whatever <laughs> and uh, we're going to show some of the more bad ads in this game uh these ads are the lusty fires that blake warned us about looking for the corrupt version of what is a natural joy or pleasure if you will like the corruption of sexuality this is a terrible ad. These are not even the bad ones. There's way worse ones. I'm just going to show another screenshot here, more advertisements. There's love next to a bunch of uh, 
plastic people with sex toys. Um, Gamora, that's a biblical reference. The number of missions in the game that were named after scriptures was crazy. Like they could not help themselves but re reference scriptures left and right. So the last slide here with these bad ads is uh, it shows this horrible fat slob with drinking a uh, beer and it says be your best self. Like that's the irony of ironies in my opinion. And I pose this question here, is your meat, which is your body, quote air quotes meat, is it a temple or is it simply a product, commodity, tool, or prison? You know, I think that's the question humanity is at the crossroads on uh, <laughs> that we need to like get we need to make our decision, all of us, what, what is our body? Are we going to treat it like it's literally the vessel that God experiences its creation through? Or are we going to treat it like, you know, it's this throwaway? Even the idea of reincarnation could lead you to this sort of like disposable body idea. I think we need to just like be here now. Don't worry about reincarnation. Don't worry about past lives. Worry about the moment. That's the only eternity that exists that is lost on everybody. They think eternity stretches way off into the future and way off behind us in the past. That's Kronos. Right now, nature itself is the only eternity. And the question that we're going to get into to finish out this conversation is like, what does it mean to corrupt our relationship with nature, to corrupt our psychological relationship to archetypes? And does that really, are we, are we corrupting God, in a sense, like by the way that reality changes as we change our perspective on these archetypal parts of ourself. I'll explain more what I mean on that as we go a little further, but I'm going to stop the screen share and pop back over to Brian because I've been on one for a minute. No, that's all right. It just got me thinking, you know, and through this, what I was thinking is, you know, there's so many people who would see this. And they're like, oh, okay, now you're going off in a crazy land. You know, I'm sorry, but we, you probably, I'm sure you didn't hear uh, a podcast I did, I think, three weeks ago or so. But I was covering uh, Dr. Richard Day, who back in 1969 was making a prediction. And it really wasn't just a prediction. I mean, he was a Harvard-schooled professor. And he was in front of a bunch of other doctors. It was just a doctor's convention. And he gave them a lecture as to what he said, this is our plan. This is what the future is going to bring. And the doctors at that time listened to him and thought, this guy's a quack. He's a nut job. But you listen to what he said today, and you don't think anything of what he had to say. Because it's the norm. That's the way things work today. You know, uh, you know, direct deposit for your paycheck, you know, that multiple cars would they'd be made by different manufacturers, but they would look identical. You know, he said there were so many things that were going to be done to morph people's mind, you know, that even he said every wire going into your house will be a spying device on you. You know, and people back then thought he was nuts. And now you listen to it and it's like, uh yeah what's the big deal and it just People shows how the power we've been slowly transitioned yeah. you know that idea of constant Absolutely. surveillance like if you really understand the power that is your witness witness itself is so powerful and i think like in a sense the only economy that's got any reality to it between human beings is the prana economy the way that we lift each other up or make each other feel bad in the most basic sense. But also like, you know, you accomplish something good and there's witness for it. That person gives you prana. They might praise you. They might just approve of you. Their field, their fieldings, their feelings are going to interact with your field and you're going to get life force energy from that. And that's a good thing. But like in the cyberpunk world, uh, which is a depiction of the way things are going. Currency is completely digital. And the way that prana is exchanged between people is strictly through money. And you can like, in your mind, 
send money to the person you're looking at and their eyes glow blue and the money transfers and the other guy's like, thank you. And they get the prana. So it's like even the basic, <laughs> even the basic like normal prana economy has been replaced by the money at that point, because like nobody does a thing without sending each other some crypto. Although in that world, it's they're called euro dollars because uh, obviously there's a one world currency and they just merge the dollar with the euro in the future of this storyline. So instead of bucks, they call them eddies, uh, which is kind of funny. But, you know, I think that's what we need to get back to is recognizing our prana economy. I got a lot of these ideas from just, I guess, this phrase, prana economy. I think I heard James True say it. I really like that phrase. I think it does describe what our interactions with each other really are. And online, that the way that the prana economy works in like socialist media is just totally vicious. Like the only uh, props that people give to each other are for parroting the view that they are into. And that happens on both sides, like the good people, I don't want to say the good people, the people with the more accurate version of reality, uh, they get their little echo chamber of other people that are going to high five them for what they're talking about. And then they're going to get, they're going to see like the wandering samurai come in to debunk them and a whole fight come up, spill out into the comments. I witnessed this, like I'll just drop a couple sentences into a status update and come back two days later, and there's 150 comments of people fighting with each other over what I said. <laughs> you know, it's it's vicious, <laughs> dude. And like, uh, I try not to even get involved in the, the prana economy of that other than to just pose the thought that I had out there and let other people use it as a as a exchange network. <laughs> I don't really want to read a lot of that that goes on in there. It's like even the people that might agree with me, they're saying some horrible shit to the their sheeple that they're calling them or whatever. And I think we just, I want to get past all of that nastiness and recognize that like, we all just want each other's witness. We all want to generally, and until we're cyber psychos, we all want to actually be good and recognize for being good and being our true self. We all want the same things. It's like getting stuck in the, uh, the digital identity, it, thinking we're are better than other people, thinking we're Neo, gonna free minds in the matrix. Just, those minds might not be ready to be freed. It's tough for me to realize too, but I think getting to be a content creator it makes that easier because I can get it out, all the things I think. I can put it on these places and then if someone wants to check it out, they can come to me, but I don't need to like, I don't need to word vomit conspiracies onto people like I used to, <laughs> I guess, at least not until I'm on the air recording. But hey, do you mind if I take like a two minute intermission real quick and come back before we kind of finish off some of the thoughts I had here? Definitely won't get through all the Go slides, but I think we'll get through the ones I want to. And this has been fun. Uh, it's kind of a new presentation for me. So I appreciate you letting me kind of iron it out, my ideas about this stuff as we go. But I'll be right back. Absolutely, no problem. <clears throat> and one of the things that Chance just mentioned, uh, he mentioned creation and creating things. And uh, people can go back to a previous interview that he had. I can't remember the name of the channel that he did it with, but uh, it was a, a podcast, but he put it on his YouTube. And he, he talked about where he found his real self at or his real value at was when he started creating something, whether it was, you know, creating written content or the YouTube channel, interviews, different things like that, that that is when he really started feeling you know, some self-value and self-worth. <clears throat> and that that's the same for everybody across the board. What, at the heart of it, when people are not creating something, they don't really feel that value. I mean, stop and think about, like, the last thing you made with your hands or something like that. You know, whether you do woodwork or you paint or whatever the case may be. You got done with that project, and it's like, oh, you're, you're, like, proud of it. You know, you get a little bit of an ego boost, and 
It's like you, you envision something, and now there it is physically. It can be seen. And that is so important. And unfortunately, the schools today, I, I would recommend people check out the writings or interviews uh, by John Taylor Gatto. And this is one of the things he covers, is that the schools do not teach you how to be a creator. It, they just teach you how to uh, follow directions, follow instructions, follow your indoctrination, if you will. And, and that's the problem. You have to go out, find a hobby or something, and learn how to create things. Because when you do that, you're not only learning so much from what you're doing. Like, for instance, I started making uh, Organite like organite pyramids and you know different things like that. And I started learning so much about the different stones, the different gems, um, the different products and how you layer them, you know, according to what was originally set out, you know, to do an inorganic and organic, then inorganic, then organic, and do at least seven layers and and then on top of it then the ingredients to make them look nice. You know what I mean? So when you start creating things, you know, it just doesn't give you a mental boost. But in your mind, it gives you an education on whatever you're working on as well. And to me, that can really turn people's lives around is when they are put in a position of being able to create something and see the result of their efforts. That really makes you, you know, here's the thing. Uh, what, what does Genesis say? That you are made in the image of the Elohim? Or you are made in the image of the Creator? Well, what is the Creator? The Creator creates stuff, right? So if you're in His image, you should be creating shit, right? Hello? <laughs> anyway, good to have you back there, Chance. How you doing, bro? I'm just loving what you're saying, man. Like, what you just described is the whole reason I started Interverse. 100%. Actually, before I got more heavily into, like, capital T truth because I had to get there myself the whole point of the show was just to interview artists who were making it doing something that they felt like was their passion their soul's reason for being here whatever because a I wanted to get there like I, th I was pretty sure even at the beginning that podcasting was that for me or one of those things for me I mean there's more than one type of creativity I'm interested in but I was like okay that's what I'm gonna make this show about until at least until the point where I feel like I've done that. And I, I'm not 100% supported by my show, but my patrons are helping me more and more every month. And, you know, I get to, I get invited to, to stuff like this with you. When I first started, I was like just talking to a very small group of a few close friends that might have tuned in. It took me a long time to find my direction, but I knew that that was a good starting point, was to try to show people that the only thing between them and like doing creating things was like the time to put in to actually make the creation and it, doing it your way is the what creativity means like I, I say that i used to say this all the time but it's a good time to remind myself and everybody that the difference between a person who's creative and a quote unquote non-creative is decisiveness the person who thinks they're not creative looks at the blank canvas and goes i don't know what to do the artist looks at the canvas and goes, first this, then that, then the next thing. And whether it's just a flow state hopping from one new idea to the next, or they had a vision and they're trying to bring it in, it's still, they're just taking one step at a time. They're just making the next choice and then the next choice and the next choice. And then if later they need to rectify a choice they made earlier by painting over it, they figure that out at that point when it's necessary. But they don't get paralyzed by indecisiveness and the the corporate future <laughs> the corporate life is to replace everything that you might have ever created with something that came from babylon and they've they're already most of the way there honestly the last colonization is in the imagination <laughs> in my opinion i mean they've they're already deeply entrenched there too they got a military base in your brain already but uh, I think that that's like the only direction 
to to go too much. And then the cyberpunk future, that's obviously kind of what's happened even more. Uh, there's not a lot of creativity, but in the few moments where there's like art that's genuine depicted in that fictional story, it has all the more impact. It's all the more poignant. And another reason why I think that there's some good guys in the cre creators of that game. It's not all one way. I think a lot of people would see this game from the outside and they'd be like, satanic, evil. And I'd be, they'd be right that it's hella violent and gory and definitely mature themes and in some some ways just too far. And it's probably the most one of the most extreme video games ever made in terms of like violence and sexuality. And all those things have an effect on a human mind. I'm not going to pretend like they don't. But... I'm also here to look at the darkness and embrace the vitriol for what it is there to do, which is to burn away your own impurities by showing you what you're not. So <laughs> that's a good place to, you know, also wanted to say John Taylor Gatto, great person to look into. You, you were talking about Gatto when I first came back in. I have a couple of recent shows from a few months back with a fella named John Coleman. And he introduced me more, more to Gatto's work than I had been before. And he's a, I don't know what you call it, a pedagogy type of guy. Like his whole platform is about how can we improve teaching and learning? How, how can we upgrade these concepts in the modern world? And those were a good couple of shows. I went on his show. He came on mine. You can check those out if you liked what Brian was saying about John Taylor Gatto, and you want to know more there. Uh, but creativity, that was like the big message of my show originally. And now I think it's just like, a, it's an established theme for me, and I, I, I still think it comes through as being a relevant, like important thing I'm harping on about all the time. But I just love that you said all that because it's stuff I could have said myself, hence why I started blabbing on about it <laughs> so much. But okay, I want to get to this concept of corrupting archetypes, if you like that. Uh, how familiar are you familiar are you with the tarot? Major Arcana. I'm fairly familiar with it. Um, and I'll say, you know, I, I started checking it out like when I was a teenager. I've got a or had a Hermeticum deck. Um, I've got friends that do readings and stuff like that. And at the same time, uh, for, oh, gosh, the better part of 30 years, I've worked in the casino industry. So, you know, a lot of people ask me, well, what do you do? I'm like, what? And they're like, you know, for a living. I'm like, well, I breathe. They're like, no, I mean, what kind of work do you do? <laughs> and I'll tell them, well, I'm a card reader. And they'll just kind of look at me and I'm like, I work in casinos. I deal cards. You know what I mean? And uh, the playing deck of cards is really a uh, part of where the tarot was at. You've got your mi minor arcana and your major arcana that you're going to be touching on here. And your major arcana, the deck of cards would be like your your face cards, your suit suited cards, you know. Yeah, I'm going to go through some major arcana stuff. So one of the esoteric things they planted in this game that totally blew my mind was an entire recreation of the major arcana but in this 2077 world and the player encounters it as graffiti and you're not meant to understand whether or not it's a hallucination based on other elements of the plot and the character's situation or if it's like some higher force trying to speak to you and for being a game so rooted in this like transhuman future that is deeper in consumerism deeper in materialism lost from spirituality, almost completely cut off. There are, they, the writers do a really good job of trying to sh demonstrate that even any, even a person that's like really obtuse to the creator trying to speak to them through signs and symbols would be a, getting the signs and symbols, even if they're not noticing it. But the player through the character's eyes could pick up on, on these themes. And I think that's really cool. They're showing how like, the synchronicity is baked into that as an element of that story. And also some mystical things happen that you can choose to interpret however you want as the player. But I choose to 
interpret it as like that cosmic giggle, the wink from God that he's, it's never gone. Reality is always there, no matter where we are. <laughs> but they, they recreated tarot deck, the major arcana for this game world is dark, man. It's like, it's going to be kind of freaky. Let me pop over to the screen share first. And I'll just show this image that's got them all. And then we can look at them one at a time a bit. And we don't have to spend too much time on any one of them. But I put this title on it, The Corruption of Archetypes. And archetypes are nature. So that's twelve. the first uh, half of the major arcana. And this is the second half of the major arcana. You might be I able to pick out what some you. of them are before we look at them one at a time. But yeah, go ahead. Um, are there any of them that have a depiction of a rabbit within them? I don't think there's a rabbit in any of them. There's a cat that is important as a plot device. Kind of, they play off in the storyline the fact that there's no animals in the city there's this mysterious cat that the character sees and you're not meant to understand if it's a real cat or hallucination or if it's a i can't remember the japanese name for it but there's like a cat spirit that's also meant to be like a guide of lost souls or something in japanese mythology and i think they might be trying to symbolize that with the cat but i don't see any rabbit symbolism in these crazy alternate major arcana cards but that's an example of the who rabbit makes, or the, the cat, I mean. Who, 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 make, who makes this tarot deck? Uh, the character experiences it in the world as graffiti. Like he sees okay. the, and they and you stop at each one when you when you see one and it's significant and it's like it blows his mind like because he like feels like that it's trying to describe what's happening to him in that place in a way. But he does you can choose to have him and or she your character interpret it as being like meaningless coincidence or hallucination or like a, a higher intelligence speaking to him it's kind of interesting these cards are pretty crazy okay you can see the fool here right yep so uh as far as what one thing i'm planning to do when i have more time later is put these side by side with the original major arcana because I think that'd help people that aren't familiar as much with it. But this is one that's not a lot different, but what's different is the environment and his clothing. The dog looks a lot less happy. It's got its tail between his legs. Dog is God backwards. Think about the dog in the original, the fool card, right? The dog is not looking that sad. And uh, this fool is about to walk off the edge of a building and he doesn't even have anything with him on his stick. I guess he's got a backpack instead, and he's got a, looks like maybe a gun. But I don't know. I, I haven't spent a lot of time trying to break down each one of these deeply. I think a lot of it, just the full effect of the image itself, is the meaning. You know, like this is what the fool looks like on the journey in the transhuman, transhuman hell. This is... <laughs> Further, this is hey, just, cool, way further into artificiality than humanity was at when the writer way tarot was created. Just, just a hint to people: if you're watching this over TalkShoe on your phone, you can expand your screen to see the photos better. Just oh yeah, it's like vertical images, so that's kind of unfortunate for a lot of people's viewing situation. But that's fine. They're they're pretty pretty wild images. Uh, this is the magician, and still got the limnascate infinity symbol, but he's got like the face. His face is removed, and behind him are well, a bunch he's of got all different faces. That I guess he could maybe put them on. Yeah, he's got all those faces, all those personas behind him that he can put on. He can be whatever you want him to be. <laughs> yeah. He's got multiple persons at his disposal. He doesn't, he's not stuck in one person. 
interesting interpretation. Really, I had and an infinity symbol on his chest. Yep, just like the Limbs got the infinity symbol on the original. But if you look at the, the table, it doesn't look like he's got any Earth disc there. You're supposed to have like a wand and a, a disc and a cup and a sword, I believe. He's supposed to have all four of the suits or the elements on the table in the original magician. But it looks like all he's got here are a bunch of different knives and some kind of a chalice with an upside down star upside down five pointed star on it. That might be a candle now that I look at it, but it looks like he's given up the elements and he's replaced all of the, ma the magician's original meaning of the elements replaced it with personas. Items yeah. of destruction. Yeah. And artifice and the symbol for the artificer, if you will, the inverted pentagram putting spirit under the other five points. So that one's really deep. <laughs> that's the black magician, if you will. That's like, that's, this is what I'm talking about with the corruption of archetypes. Like, uh, they're saying that in the future, if we could go this much further from nature, then this is what we're going to look at as the magician, which is going to represent like power in a way. That's one of the main things the magician represents, like mastery. So this is what mastery looks like in the, fa the further fallen man further fallen realm if you will pretty crazy like I, this isn't a video game you know like <laughs> to me this blows my mind this level of like esoteric nudging blows my mind chance <clears throat> chance it this uh i really want to bring this up it, and, and I've heard these stories many times, but uh, somebody sent me a video today. And it was a gentleman who had talked to an elderly lady from, I think it was Czechoslovakia. <clears throat> and he was kind of like asking her, have you started seeing anything here in America that reminds you of something of the past? And she started talking about, you know, the fall into communism. And the more she talked, the more it built up. And she got to the point of almost being irate because she's like, you know what? Nobody will effing listen to me when I try and explain this to them. You're the first person to ask. She said, these things that are happening here, I saw it happen before. I know what direction it's heading in. And people don't pay any attention to history. And it's. I lost your audio for a second there. Well, more than a second, I still can't hear you at the moment. Am I here? There you are. Oh. All right. I, I, I like the saying by. Uh, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. He said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And she was so upset because people don't pay attention to history. Because she's seen this happen before in her home country. And she's watching it now in America. And it's time people wake up from the ideological subversion that Yuri Bezmenov talked about and realize what's really happening. Anyway, go ahead with your deck there. I think for time's sake, I won't go through all 22 major arcana. I'll just pick out a couple because it would take a while to do 22 of these. And I'll save that for another time someday somewhere where I've spent more time breaking them down myself. For now, I just think it's relevant to con uh, to the concept of like the corrupted nature, corrupted archetypes, corrupting our nature. So let me, oh, you guys have been able to see me, what I've been doing over here the whole time. This is one I thought was really wild. This is uh, the Wheel of Fortune. You've got the Corpo man with his briefcase with plastic cards. You know, obviously killed. He's got a virtual reality looking visor on. 
So we've lost, again, we've lost the symbol of the elements here and the symbols of life and nature that are in the original Wheel of Fortune. I'll just look that up so we can see. Huge difference here. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually I've dealt the Wheel of Fortune game in casinos before. Gosh, that's a boring game to deal. <laughs> very different. Here we see that fortune or man's fate is ruled by these forces, which represent the sky clock, actually. If you know what you're talking about. There's a lot of I won't break down this card all that's not really what this presentation's for. I know people should just research tarot if they're interested, and I'm sure they will or they have. But comparing it to this, again, like the magician, the elements are gone, replaced by, I guess, this virtual reality visor. And it's death instead of symbols that represent life. Uh, and these plastic things, maybe that's like sort of the devil that's over here in this one. I'm not sure. The plastic is... Very relevant, though, because that's the new sky clock, if you will, the markets, the digital currency, the uh, paper C, papal, paper C, paper C. <laughs> but now it's no longer a paper C, it's a digital C. And the metaphor is even more accurate, really, there. So that one I just thought was really deep. Um, let me skip ahead. This is the high priestess, really creepy. Uh, it's got still got the. Boaz and Joaquin pillars, I think that's really relevant. They're still, she's still like the intermediary between those two forces, if you will, the high priestess, but now she doesn't even have feet. So the goddess that's supposed to be connected to the earth, if you will, or the high priestess that's supposed to be the spokes voice for the earth, mother earth and Gaia is lost its grounding. It's hovering with no feet. That's creepy. This is creepy to me. <laughs> Yeah. The image. I well, the two pillars, the, the two pillars, and I've mentioned this many times, if you go through history, every society is built on two pillars, the pillar of the priests and the pillar of the kings. So there's always going to be those two pillars there. I mean, you look at even uh, King John first and sixth and uh, King James, he said, you know, there would be no king without a priest. That's your two pillars. And she's off anyway. of her throne. She would be on a seated before the pillars in the original tarot, and she's standing or hovering like a wraith. And it looks like her uh -oh. arms are out, like she's blocking you from getting close to these pillars. Mm -hmm. And she's blocking your entrance. It's terrifying. Got just one red eye, machine eye. So this is uh, the Empress. I might skip past this one because I'm really not 100% sure. This looks like, you know, love is, the Empress is Venus, first of all. And you've got the symbol for Venus right there on this mm -hmm. woman's jacket. But she's got a sword and she's like killed somebody that's really fucked up. But she's standing in, she's standing in nature. Like this is one of the, this might be one of the only ones that shows any form of nature at all. And she's just looking up and crying. I think this shows us, it's an interesting symbolism, you know, like, this part of nature, this archetype has had to become a warrior. Love has to become a warrior and it hurts. I actually feel this deeply now that I look at it. Uh, Cause that's what Venus represents. That's the Empress's archetype in the tarot. It's a, important, it's the, it's the guiding motherly force of love, sometimes disciplinary, but other, other times nurturing and all times connected to nature, it's Taurus. That's why it's unstoppable. She looks like you don't mess with her. Like she's killed a lot of these crazy cyborg monster children. But she, she's got her eyes closed also. Yeah, and the city is in the background too. Man, this one at first I didn't get it. And then I looked at it and I was like, this is the power of the archetypes, man. It spoke right to me. All I have to have is a little symbolic literacy. And I felt it with my fieldlings. Like I felt an emotion. This made me. This made me have real feelings, and I think that's what's important to understand about how these things play on us and how we can learn about ourselves through them if we're not being played by them. <laughs> well, Chance, here's the thing, Chance, is that 
there are so many signs and symbols that are in front of us that we don't realize. I mean, right down to a yield sign or a stop sign or even the emblems on different sports teams or cars or whatever that visually we don't think much of it. We don't think much consciously, but our subconscious knows. And so our subconscious can absorb these things and go, whoa, what's going on? But consciously, we have no clue. And so people in the body, the reason people have no clue a lot of the time is body dysphoria. The body doesn't even have the electricity to produce an emotional reaction in your field to the thing. So it just goes straight into the below the surface of your consciousness. Symbolic literacy, on the other hand, it adds electricity because your witness is actually comprehending what it's seeing. And so you're bringing it into your conscious mind, bringing it up to the optic thalamus. Oh, inevitably opening your aperture wider of your third eye, letting a little more light through because you're trying to see. You're like, oh, I think I recognize what this is. And then at that point, you start to focus. Aperture dilates, you get more light, and you feel something from what you're looking at. And I think that's why symbolic literacy, to whatever degree you can attain it, is psychic self-defense 101, most important part of it. Because then propaganda just doesn't hit like it did before because you can purify it <laughs> with your mind you can see it for what it is and you can i think also recognize how you feel more deeply anytime that you're doing any level of aperture opening and these archetypes can definitely make you feel things especially when you know the archetype of love the goddess of love herself is now forced to like kill people with a sweet katana <laughs> you know that's not what she wants to do that's not what we want to do right we want to we want to right. avoid this corruption of our archetypes we don't want to have to kill the lost souls we don't want to have to fight for our life just to have a small patch of nature in a a giant artificial hell world that's not what we want okay so this one's another really deep one uh this is the emperor the emperor used to be on a throne, and now he's connected up to all these wires, telling you that data is the data, not sort of justice or righteousness, is what rules in this world. Information itself. And information, I think, Clint has taught me this really well, but the concept of information is completely different than the concept of truth or reality. Because a lot of what information is, I mean, it's all language based. And so in a way, it's always some degree of artifice, whereas like the real language is your feelings and how those project from your field into another field. That's the real language. But our, we've told our brain that the only way that it can tell we can interpret our feelings is if it puts it through a language. And so it's like, God, OK, and then tries to do that. And then in the external, that comes through in much deeper ways because it's a bigger brain <laughs> that we're in, if you will. But this information is artificial information. It's like facts about fictions, right? It's like, it's one of those tubes has probably got like what I did for, for dinner last night and where I went the next day. And, you know, just random cartoon panels of a cartoon universe, which is the digital ecosystem of big data. It's all, you know what I mean? It's all fake. Uh, it's all fiction based. So it, I, that's how I connect it back to the straw man as we were, we started out talking about. That's what, this is what it represents. The emperor is now ruled by this data rather than being the man on a throne, like the righteous law giver, if you will. You know, there's Chance. a negative side and a positive side to the emperor in the original tarot. So, of course, it could mean like a tyrannical character as well. But all these archetypes have a higher resonance and a lower resonance. But in this tarot, it's like most of it is lower resonance. The only, this is the only one that I thought had any kind of like higher vibration. And, of course, it is the goddess of love. So it makes sense that that one could still attain. That archetype is not really destroyable, you know. Like, she'll destroy you first. <laughs> but, yeah, go ahead, well, you know what? Yeah, I was reading an article. 
a little over a year ago by a banker, a financial advisor for a bank. And it, it was an older gentleman. And he was talking about his years in banking and stuff like that. And he was talking about data and information. And he said, if you had ever told me years ago that data would become a commodity, I would have laughed at you. And he said, now today, data is the number one commodity. Yeah, that's the that's the emperor, right? <laughs> that's a perfect, yeah. perfect symbol. I think I'm just going to do a couple more, two more. There's, it'd be hard to really pick and choose, so we'll just knock out a couple more. Uh, the Hierophant is the next one here. Let's see. Seeing that? Now, this would be like yep. a Pope figure, and it seems like it's also hooked up to the data. And it, That's um, scary as crap, dude. That's the that's the cyber poke of 2077. <laughs> oh my God. That's scary as shit. Yeah. These artists didn't mess around. He's got the two Did keys. He's got the keys of, uh, um, a Peter on his chest. <laughs> cyber Pope, dude. Terrifying. He's still got the staff too with the, what I call antiquitech. I I'm pretty sure shapes like that, like in that staff have something to do with free energy. Uh, drawing in free energy i think that's the thing. last thing they want us to understand is how things make us feel because that's the ticket to understanding the prana economy and that's the real economy of nature that we're kept from accessing by replacing it with currency fake currency i think that's the last thing they want us to find out about is uh how we really feel <laughs> well chance <laughs> chance look at that staff feel. Look at that staff he has, and I can't remember what church it is, but they, they use the um, symbol of the cross it has two bars on it, which to me, I'm like, oh, you, you guys have a double cross. <laughs> well, here, there's three bars going across on the top of that staff. So it's like, okay, you've been triple crossed, man. You, you've been <laughs> crossed by mind, body, and spirit. Could be. I mean, I think there's so much to that symbolism uh i've been really side note like deeply researching alternative chronology and just the massive inconsistencies between physical real world artifacts and buildings and the story about where they came from like just pick a place and if you start d diving in you can find out very quickly that it doesn't make sense the story you're told about where some of the stuff comes from and part of that is the idea of antiquitech that there was free energy devices already available uh, at some point before the current regime whenever they did it managed to like reset civilization and wipe out the real history of the human race whatever that is and so well, I, there's a well, lot of like, that you see that symbol it, on churches and and like um what do you call them cathedrals and stuff and and old buildings are sometimes they still sometimes have that type of design coming at the top somewhere like antennas and there's good research to to suggest that that is has something to do with generating uh free electricity free prana from the earth plugging yeah, do in you watch uh do you watch john levi oh yeah dude john levi's the I man mean, i love that guy he's so cool i love his voice <laughs> Look, well, I, I, th I think it could be irritating to some people, but I mean, you you look back at some of these buildings that have been built, and everybody focuses on the pyramids, and it's like, no, there's so much more than just the pyramids. It, it's just like uh, a few episodes I've done. Everybody focuses on the obelisk. It's like, no, it's not the obelisk. It's it's the arches that have been built. That's what you got to pay attention to. And some of these things that have been done is like, wait a minute. There is no way this could have ever occurred. People, people could barely do it today, and definitely not in the time like the time that they say these things were done. Yeah, I mean that's a whole that that's content I want to make in the future for my show, talking about that stuff. But I'm still doing the research and figuring out who I can get on to uh, discuss it. But 
This is the last card I'm going to pull up. It's the last one I have opened. This is supposed to be the lovers, which is like the Adam and Eve archetype. And uh, they're just bones. That's all that's left of the original man and woman. And I think that is maybe symbolic of the fact that like this, in this 2077 world, people have replaced most of their body. So all that's left that's real, that's still barely holding on is like the deepest core part. That might be why the tongue is how they're touching each other, possibly because that's like the only sense that you have taste that is inside of you completely. Like the tongue has to, the mouth has to be opened to taste things, you know? And so they can only touch maybe through that like last inside sense of taste. I don't know. This is all just off the top of my head trying to read the symbolism. Uh, the black triangle, and it's skewed slightly to the left, if I'm not mistaken. Do you also think that looks like it's a little off-center, like not perfectly tilted up, that black triangle? Yeah, it is slightly uh, tilted to the left, and it's surrounded by the circle, which was the Egyptian symbol for God or whatever, the sun god. And But the, the skull at the top is smaller, so that would hint that that's a female and that skull has the snake all around it. Yeah, and the man's got the burning bush behind him. Yep, he's got the burning bush. <laughs> and so I think the triangle, which is the fire triangle, fire symbol, it's the yod of for sure, something like that. The way it's tilted to the left, displaying that it's imbalanced a little bit, just like the fact that if the sun was a little too strong, if we had a little too much yang in the energy of the universe then we'd be melted down to skeletons and the bush would be burning or whatever and so that could yeah. be sort of what's going on here too that it's symbolizing that the fabled tilt of the earth's axis if you will even our heart is slightly off to the left the left brain imbalance the masculine domination the scientific rationalizing left braining of everything, putting everything through that filter of dividing it up into its pieces and its parts and trying to figure out how it ticks. Um, I think it's, I think it's a William Blake or maybe like William Wordsworth, pretty sure William Blake who says we murder to dissect. And that's like the whole thing with modern materialist science is like, uh, you think that you're going to understand something by breaking it up, chopping it up. But then the life has gone from it. It's like Crow says all the time that the old alchemist apparently used to write about if you divide wine up into all the parts that make the wine and you say that you can identify that it's got grapes, it's got water, it's got this flavoring, whatever, or break it down into molecules or whatever, you're still missing the component of taste. Like, well, where's the taste? You can't take that out of it can't separate that from what it is and it loses it loses the taste if you take all the parts away from each other there's something to that and i think that's kind of where i'm going for the the wrap up if you will is well yeah that's what that's what blake says about western medicine <clears throat> he says that in western medicine when we want to figure out how something works the first thing we do is we kill it <laughs> and it's like what <laughs> that makes yeah, no but sense but that's what we do dissect. yeah and if we gotta if if we do that to ourselves it's not going to be good right like maybe that's not maybe but maybe that's part of the learning process and uh some of us will bail out of that process early enough to not be completely self-murdered but the last slide here is a character from cyberpunk he's one of the main villains and he's basically just like the top of a head attached to a, a giant killer cyborg robot thing and anyway i think it illustrates the point of how much of yourself which is nature can you replace and still be real and i would contend that you're always going to be real and what you're doing is actually corrupting nature which is a that's fucked up man sorry excuse my language what you're doing is you're changing the entire fractal for your own selfish reason. And it's going to take that fractal a lot, like that much more time to just get itself back into shape. 
I think what I mean here is body parts themselves are archetypes. Like all those tarot cards, all the sky clock designations that correlate to, they also connect to organs and they connect to like, you know, Aries is the optic thalamus, the top of the head. The emperor is an Aries ruled card. All of that data going to his head, the corruption of the third eye, the phone being like a surrogate third eye, artificial third eye, controlled by a demiurge, Urizen. And also behavior. This is the other thing that I think is really crucial. Behavior is also nature. It's literally like synonyms, if you think about it. Like your nature is also your behavior. And so we got to decide what version of nature. Man must decide what version of nature he wants to be. That's what I'm saying here. A corrupted archetype, which is what archons are, in my opinion. The archons are the ways that we have become addicted to fiction, addicted to untruth. I think that all of those archons are higher archetypes if in a purified or sanctified temple. They all of those lowercase g gods of pantheons are part of you, like powers that you have. Everything <laughs> is your quality, your property. It's a matter of which of them you want to be, human being. Being's a verb. You know, not an identity. It's your behavior. That's your being. <laughs> anyway, I think hopefully that all kind of ties together. I'll be honest, it's a little late for me over here, so I'm uh, slowing down a bit. But it's been a really fun conversation. I've learned a lot about what I think about this stuff and I'll probably do more somewhere, a kind of continuation of this or maybe like a, an improved version. So thanks for letting me run it by you and your crew. This is hopefully cool. Uh, I don't know if it's the normal level of esoteric that you typically go, but I know you're up for it, Brian. <laughs> no, this is, this is very cool. And, you know, for people who don't know, um, I've spoken on the phone with Chance once. A lot of people I've had on, like Jared Griffin, other people, I've not spoke to at all before I've had them on. You know what I mean? But, you know, Chance, well, we knew right away that we were both on the same kind of playing field or whatever our ideas were the same okay um and so that's really what made this work out and no this is absolutely perfect chance but i want to say you, you know truth. yeah if we can be on board with what the definition of truth is which is like reality <laughs> then yeah the rest will f come together somehow yeah, truth is not the perception. Perception reality? No, perception reality is a lie. But, um, you know, I tell people every week, I guess people say, well, where should I start learning? I tell them, learn who you really are, where you're really from, and where you're really at. Because and you I'll can actually be say, I all three levels. Perfect. Perception reality is truth, I think. It's just a matter of if you've put screens and filters between perception that are <laughs> causing over artificial overlay. I really, I really yeah. think so. You know, I, that's what I mean by there your you feelings. Go. Your feelings are the original language and that those are big time a perception. Uh, that's a whole other conversation though. I've come to really, I've, I've come to some deeper, in my opinion, understanding at least of ideas that I accept about how perception works. That's different, a really different take. Uh, then it's kind of, I think that the mainstream version of what perception is, is an, an inversion, at least a, the belief about it, how it works. I guess if I can run through it real fast, just so I'm not leaving everyone hanging, it's that your, if your perceptions coming from your different senses were to be wired such that they go from the point of the sensation up to your brain, they would not travel at the right speeds as far as neural impulses from like your toes to your head, from your ears to your brain for the central processor of those things to get them in the right order, if that makes sense. These senses are electrical signals. They, they travel at different speeds to the neural network because there's different distances. What I'm saying is it doesn't, there's no way to, there's no proof that your senses all converge into your brain and your brain 
itself is putting those somehow into a holographic projection of a world, uh, if that makes sense. And that that perception is somehow false. It's like an image in your head. Instead, what I think is going on is that there is a primary reality, one energy, unified whole that is the eternal present moment, reality itself, truth. And then we have an aperture that is our like pineal gland or optic thalamus. And that that aperture opens or closes to the degree of reality that our amygdala thinks that we can accept without freaking out. And then from there, that signal of reality, that first energy, the, the pure white light, the original source, is then subdivided after the optic thalamus out into the different parts of the brain that connect to different body parts. And so it's one signal that's already together and unified that's then split like a rainbow prism to give us a unified multiplicity of different sensations at once that all work together. I think that's the only way it can make sense. And in which case, spiritual experiences, mystic transcendental experiences, crazy trips, if you will, there's something you're actually perceiving in that. And there's more to it. Like I think that, that, that there's a lot to do with imagination being something that creates and perceives simultaneously. But, you know, that'll maybe be a good conversation for another time because I know that you're, you're in for it since we uh, talked about how creating itself is like the real spiritual path. Becoming creative is like becoming like uh, the creator the way he wants us to be. <laughs> In my opinion, that's the fire that absolutely to not steal from God, but just like use, um, wield, wield. Yeah, what we are made to be, you know. And I guess in closing out, chance, um, a lot of times, you know, it's like you, you could sit at the freaking local corner tavern and listen to all the men complain about all the problems, and we hear this stuff on YouTube and all all over the place we're always hearing all the problems but what i always like to leave people with is there's a solution so with the direction that and i know this is probably throwing a big stake on your plate right now but with all of the things that we see in the direction that things are heading in what solution would you offer to people tricky question because everyone's in a different place doing a different thing with different circumstances. I think, like I said a minute ago, having a correct definition of truth is the really only thing between someone having a truth radar or not having it. Like to me, that's the, the reason people are like seekers and they're stuck looking for truth is because they never defined what truth was. They're asking, what is truth? What's the truth? You have to answer that question if you want to move past that stage of your development. And the truth is a self-evident reality. That's why I had to jump in, not to like disagree with you combatively, but just to voice my opinion that I think that the perceptions in a purified vessel, the perceptions do give you the, the absolute reality. It's not like a, a, it's not a simulation. It's not an approximation. You're really here, man. You're really seeing me. We're really talking to each other. This is, it's really happening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so solutions would be look for the ways that you can sanctify or purify your temple. Look for the ways that you can see the higher version in whatever archetype you're experiencing. Love is the force of recognizing and allowing the full potential of whatever you love, whatever it is you love, allowing the potential to express organically with its own free will and recognizing the infinity of that potential. Definition of love. It's a big opening. It's a dilation. So try to let that be the way that you look at your reality. Look at it. Try to just be like right now. I think a solution people can take to heart is tell yourself that you're okay with dilating a little more of that optic thalamus. Tell yourself that it's all right to ramp up 
sort of the intensity of how much reality that you're experiencing. You know, let yourself take another little step in your personal path, wherever you're at in that ability to see what's real without freaking out. <laughs> because at the end of the day, the thing that freaks us out is how powerful we really are. That we have all the responsibility, therefore, of our situation and of our nature and the nature of the planet. And everyone's afraid to admit to it. They're, if someone might accuse me of telling everyone that they're God. No, I did not ever say anyone was. I used to have misconceptions about that. Now I realize, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you. I don't think that I was in a bad place to have the conceptions that I had. They led me to where I am now. And at the end of the day, thinking that way also opened me up to the realization that I have a lot of responsibility. So I guess like if you're willing and ready to dilate a little bit more to the capital T truth, then the next steps that are going to help you most in your reality to have a better nature, if you will, better behavior, healthier body. I mean, what then uh, you'll, then you'll know what steps to take. I mean, that's, those are for you to figure out. I think that that basic question of like how willing to dilate you are is uh, the most help you can be to yourself. Like give yourself permission. And in, even if it freaks you out, be okay that you freaked out. Be ready to go in again. <laughs> Op let's open up. I've got a weird question for you. I got yeah. a weird question for you. Do you have brothers, sisters? One, one little sister. Oh, little sister. So that tells me you're firstborn. That's true. Correct. I, I was invited into a room a few months ago where we were going through the Hebrew language and deciphering things in the Hebrew language. And just out of the blue, and this was like three hours long, but out of the blue about halfway through, um, uh, the gentleman that was hosting it, he said, hold on. He said, I got a question for everybody. How many of you here are firstborn? And there were 17 of us there. Now, how I got invited into this group, I had no idea. Anyway, 16 people out of 17 were firstborn. And he said, that's just a question that he asked people now and then because he keeps seeing this being uh just kind of a, a pattern. He keeps saying these firstborns are like the searchers leading the way. So I just thought it'd be fun to pose that question to you. You know, I've seen a pattern amongst people that are like sort of the ones really looking to figure out how to heal the reality of where it's at. I've seen a pattern that a lot of them have Aries or Leo prominent in their chart in the sun sign, moon sign, or rising sign. But I've never heard the firstborn thing. And I think in a Chinese medicine sense, it's even thought that the firstborn carries the most of the family's prana economy, if you will, because the bodies of their parents had more prana to give to that child. I'm not saying that I think that's true. That's just a, a folk belief. I'm not saying I don't accept it either, though. I think we need to be willing to not be offended if something like that wound up being true. It doesn't make uh, the second born or the third born or the tenth born less of a priceless gift of nature, okay? just means they might have a different path in the world. And it doesn't make it invalid. I mean, for all we know, they, their soul would have chose that type of you know, not every soul is ready to have a super high level of energy to hold it. That's why so many people aren't waking up despite how obvious the lies are. Some people just aren't ready to hold that much. We got to practice how much we, how much truth can we hold at once? You know, how much reality can we behold at once witness? And it's tough. I mean, I'm not like, I'm fine. I'm not there. I'm, there's no all the way there. It's infinite stairs, but this is what I'm learning right now. So that's what I feel like sharing. And yeah, it's been, it's been a fun conversation, Brian. This has been awesome. Uh, can't wait to share this with people. Really appreciate well, you giving me 
chance to talk so much about this stuff. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on, Chance. And you're absolutely right. You know, it doesn't matter if you're second born, third born, doesn't matter if you're tenth born. We all have a role to play. And it, what it really comes down to, to me, is not seeking externally as to what our role is, but we need to seek internally. We need to have our relationship with our source and find our role. And as simple or complex as it may be, dwell on that and, and do our best to complete it. It doesn't matter if you complete it or not. What matters is you've done your best. Everything is about intent. Everything is intent. Thanks, Chance. And hopefully uh, we'll have you on again in the future. This was really interesting. And well, we opened up a lot of avenues that we could go down you know, a couple hours on. So but this, this was an excellent overview. And I hope people go and check out Chance on Interverse. And if you look at the description box for this talk show, it's posted there. If you see the ad for this on Facebook, the channel is posted there as well. Everybody, go join the Interverse channel. Get connected. Get connected with like-minded people. That's what it's all about because you don't know how much longer that's going to be possible. That's all I got to say. Good night, yeah. Chance. Good night, man. Take care, everybody. Appreciate it.